Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 29th, I think it's the 29th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. All right, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, let's talk about current market conditions. We have a lot to talk about with just that in and of itself. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, keep the questions on the slides until we get towards the end of the presentation, and uh, I'll open it up to all questions then and then keep your stock picks just hang on to them until we get to the live charts and that'll just make it easier for me to see your picks and not get them caught up in the uh, mixed up in the questions and also just ask about one stock at a time and hit return that way I can make sure I get to all of your stock picks and that's for your benefits so today we talk about traits of successful traders and I want to continue the bear market update. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, today I want to talk about traits of successful traders. And at the last minute, I added this sum in here. The reason I added sum in here is this is the glass board that I've been working on for my trading psychology course, my master trading psychology course, and stuff that I've been working on for quite a while. And it keeps growing and growing and growing. And there's a lot of things that uh, I, I haven't even put on here yet. So there's quite a few traits of successful traders. But what I'd like to do today is focus on the most important aspects of them. And as usual, I hate when somebody presents a problem without a solution or covers something and doesn't tell you how to acquire that. So I want to talk a little bit, in addition to talking about the traits of successful traders, tips about how, tips on how to acquire them. When I first came to my office today, I'm like, I'm going to talk about patience because we're in a market of patience you have to be really patient given the current conditions and I'm gonna flesh this out ad nauseum throughout this presentation and then instead of reinventing the wheel which I'm often guilty of doing I went in and says well let me just see when did I talk about patience and I talked about patience last spring and then I noticed I talked about it last summer last fall and then all of a sudden I realized wait a minute that was Last week, I just talked about patience. So, obviously, I can't emphasize patience enough. Now, as I said last week, there's two forms of patience. The first form of patience is to wait for your pitch. And that's hard because we feel the pressure that we should always be doing something. And I don't want to digress too far because I've talked about this ad nauseum. But the problem is that successful people, the people who are most drawn to trading, people who have already achieved something in their current or prior careers, tend to be the least patient people, and they can't wait for the ideal trade to come along. It's not part of their mindset. Now, if you want to know more about this, watch last week's Dave Langer's The Week in Charts, where I talked about where a psychiatrist explained to me why this is so. Now, since we're using this baseball analogy, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to throw out a little question here. Who holds the record for the most walks? Anyone know? Out of all the baseball players in history, who holds the record for the most walks? Anyone? Quite a bunch today. Is this thing on? <laughs> Bonds, good job, James. How'd you know that? Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds holds the record for the most amount of walks. And uh, Phil says he hates baseball. Eh, it's Every time I try to watch baseball, I watch it for about three hours, and then I go pee, 
and then something happens, you know, it's kind of like, I've been to a couple of minor league games. It's kind of like, eh, you know, it's like, I think I'll go pee. There's nothing going on here. And then all of a sudden, kind of reminds me of sailing. Hours of boredom interrupted by brief moments of sheer panic. And if you've ever been sailing, you know what that <laughs> that is. But yeah, Barry Bonds, now, like him or hate him, or I know he's a little controversial subject, but all those steroids he took didn't, didn't help him in his walking ability, didn't help him to be patient. If anything, might have made him more impatient. So greatest home run hitter ever with uh, the caveat of, yeah, he had on some, he took some performance enhancing drugs, obviously, but still he holds the records for the most amount of walks. So that's something that's pretty impressive. It takes a tremendous amount of patience to sit there and wait for the so-called fat pitch. Now, Steve Pressfield wrote a little book called The War of Art, kind of a play on the, the art of war uh, phrase, book, whatever. But it's a good read, and I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed this. And it's a very small little book. You can get it off my website if you go to Books to Read on that URL there. And it's one of those Tim Ferriss finds, and it's a very, like I said, a little short read. It's just a paragraph or two on each page, and it deals a lot with resistance. And he said, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity will elicit resistance. So it's hard to sit there and be patient and wait for the so-called fat pitch. It's hard to wait for that trade to come along. It's even harder, as we'll talk about in just one second, it's even harder to stay in that trade. But one thing that I've been into in more recent times through Tim, I'm a huge Tim Ferriss fan, and I just finished Tribe of Mentors, and one of my takeaways from Tribe of Mentors, of many, is that everyone thinks about the macro. Everyone thinks about the big picture. Everybody thinks about being successful in life. But you have to realize that success is made up in the micro. And that's when you are going to get that resistance, as Mr. Pressfield talks about. So in that moment when you have to take action or not take action, depends on how you want to look at it, you just have to do what has to be done or not do anything in the case of waiting for that trade. So any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity will elicit resistance. And that's one reason why trading is so hard is that you will be tempted to do things unnecessarily. Now, again, as I preached last week, and we'll go through this pretty quickly to get to the rest of these, but you're really going to need the patience to just let things unfold. So there's two forms of patience. Obviously, you want to let the market come to you, and then once you do take a trade, let the market move. I learned early, early on in my career, most of the amount of money I made, was when I went sailing in the West Indies. And back then, we had a, you didn't have cell phones. We had a sat phone. didn't work that well. It was like $5 a minute or something ridiculous. And I just left the trades on while I left. And when I got back, I was pretty excited because I made a bunch of money. Immediately cashed out. And I would have made many times that amount had I stayed on vacation. So you do have to be Patient, And the point I'm making there is sometimes the patience is simply removing yourself from your screens. Um, I was talking, as I told a thousand times, I was talking with a client a while back. And he said, we've talked a little bit about the markets. We looked at a couple charts. There was nothing to do. And then he says, well, I'm going to go find something to do that's far more interesting. He's retired. So instead of sitting there looking at a stupid chart, He's going to go spend some time with some loved ones or enjoy a hobby or do something else. And that's the hardest, easiest thing you ever do, as I say, just to let things unfold or to 
wait for your pitch. And Ken Lambert once said, as I've quoted him before, doing nothing is harder than it looks. And I'm pretty sure it's Ken Lambert. Now, the problem with Jesse Livermore is once you start quoting him, you can't stop. And I noticed in today's presentations, I had to just, after a point, I'm like, good Lord, this is almost like the Jesse Livermore presentation. It was never my thinking that made the big money for me. It always was a setting. Now, there's two ways of looking at this, and people have looked at it from both sides. But either I think either one is correct. One is not right over the other. It's a sitting once you're in a position waiting for things to unfold. And a lot of people said that this initial quote or what he was inferring to was the fact that you need to sit once you're in a position and let things unfold. And some of these um, – did I say both of those? Sit and let things unfold or sit and wait for something to happen. And then he went on to say money is made by sitting, not trading. Don't give me timing. Give me time. And a man who could see straight and clearly and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do, the market does not beat him. They beat themselves because... Though they have brains, they cannot sit tight. They try to make something happen. You need to respect the market. Like right now, if you're a trend follower, and yes, it's been going down lately, but if you back the chart out a little bit, as I said last week, and I adjusted this a little bit because we were a little higher last week, but this week we're around 2,600, and you go back to last November, and we were around 2,600. That's the net net thing. One of the easiest things in trading to do. Where's the market now? Where was the market? A week ago, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and so on and so forth. So as a trend follower, there's not a whole lot to do right now. Yes, we have on a couple of shorts. But they hadn't paid off just yet. So what do we do? Well, we wait. And as you would imagine, with a methodology that requires the market to pull back, most of my methodology, as you likely know, is pullback related. Even when in the transitional stuff, it's still pullback related. So if you think about it, oops. So we look to play pullbacks, meaning we look for a trend and we look for a pullback in that trend. Well, right now, the market is headed lower and it hasn't pulled back. Maybe when it pulls back a little bit, we'll have something to do. But in the meantime, we just remain patient and take things one day at a time. And it can be a little frustrating. I realize that. I spend a couple hours every night at least going through my charts. And a lot of times there's nothing to do. And as I've said before, we spend a lot of time doing research on things that we don't ultimately do. And I think that was Steve Edmondson said that. Now, during less than ideal conditions, and this is kind of the beat the dead horse thing, but you need to keep yourself extremely busy outside of the markets. Sometimes it's as simple as turning your screens off. Go do something else. As I preach ad nauseum, I keep myself extremely busy. I do webinars like right now. I read every chance I get. I have hobbies. My wife calls me hobby boy. And as far as my work life goes, I do videos, webinars again. I write. I just do anything to keep me from watching the screen. If I get bored and watch the screen, I can all but guarantee you that I will fire off a trade. And my epiphany throughout the years, my biggest epiphany, I guess, early in my career is when I stopped, actually stopped trading because I was too busy and I seemed to be digging myself in a hole anyway. So it was kind of like definition of insanity thing, right? What's the definition of sanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting to different outcome. So I said, well, let me just stop this trading thing and finish this book. And then all of a sudden, opportunities started coming to me. Not right away, but over time. And I started practicing what I was preaching. I can't write a book and be a hypocrite and not practice what I preach. And before you knew it, I started saw, seeing, started sawing, started seeing setups just come to me and it reached a point where just, I couldn't stand it. I had to take the trade. So 
as in getting back to like the Tim Ferriss thing, one thing that he kind of reiterates is if you're looking at a potential opportunity and you're not thinking F yeah, then pass. So make sure you're thinking that when you're looking at a setup. And if it's something that's less than F, yeah, just say, well, this isn't the greatest setup in the world, but I think I'm going to take it. And sometimes it can be hard because, like, I had a setup last week, or was it early this week? I forget. But everything's blur lately with working out of two different offices. I think it was early this week, yeah. Uh, I was looking at dollar yen, and I sort of had a setup, but it had some problems. Had a lot of overhead supply, and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to pass because it, I don't have that F yeah feeling, and it took off without me. Now, I am a little bit aggravated that I didn't take the trade, but I have to practice what I preach and say, okay, well, I made that decision, and now I have to live with it. By the way, that's the secret to trading. I know the secret to trading. Here I am always saying, there's no secret to trading, and then I come back and say, oh, here's the secret to trading. Two things. One, making decisions, which is easy. Two, living with them. The good thing is if you make better decisions going in, garbage in, garbage out, right? Another one of my mantras. But if you make better decisions going in through better stock selection, through better trading in better markets, okay, not trading during less than ideal conditions, then your living with decision gets a lot easier. Jesse Livermore, in one of his confessions, said, again, there's Jesse Livermore, I'll let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment. The desire for constant action, irrespective of the underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. Now, I'm kind of thinking, getting a little further ahead of myself, but as I'm going to mention in a minute, as these guys out there, oh, you can make all this money and you can make $10,000 just after breakfast. And they make it sound like it's easy. Well, it's not. Okay, It's not easy being patient waiting for your pitch. You can't expect regular wages from the market. Now, if you follow a system longer term and it's a viable system, longer term you will be pleasantly surprised. But the market is not a continual money machine. And I'm going to flesh that out in a few minutes. And again, once you start quoting Livermore, very hard to stop. Remember this. When you're doing nothing, those speculators who feel they must trade day in and day out are laying the foundation for your next venture. You will reap the benefits from their mistakes. And if you think about technical analysis, there's nothing magical about technical analysis, at least when you look at technical analysis from the lens of you're reading the psychology of the market. That's the only thing that you need to think about with technical analysis. So he just said these speculators who feel they must trade day in and day out. So people are fighting it out. Okay, what happens? Well, they end up canceling each other out and makes a base. Now, if you could avoid trading during the sideways market and then that market cracks and then you say you have a little pullback, okay, something like a first thrust or something like a bow tie, which we'll take a look at in just a few minutes, then you go in and you could trade and these people literally built the foundation. It makes a little bit more sense, I guess, on the long side. But it's the same principle, but I know most people are – long only. So when you play that pullback, it's a disequilibrium caused by all these people who traded during that less during those less than ideal conditions. So that's what he is getting to. Holy crap. I forgot how much I quoted Livermore today. This this should be like the Livermore show. The reason is that a man may see straight and clearly and yet become impacted or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do. As you'll see in a few minutes, as we talked about last couple of weeks, maybe, and I know maybe is a key word in that sentence, but maybe this market is putting in a big picture process 
type of top, okay? And if it is, and you feel like it is, then you're going to make a lot of money eventually. That doesn't mean that you need to go in right now, but it means you need to be prudent. So he says the market does not beat them. They beat themselves because though they have brains, they cannot sit tight. Now he talks about old turkey neck. An old turkey neck was a bull. And old turkey neck was dead right in doing and saying what he did. He not only had the courage of his convictions, but the intelligent patience to sit tight. Disregarding the big swing and trying to jump in and out was fatal to me. Nobody can catch all the fluctuations. In a bull market, your game is to buy and hold until you believe the bull market is near its end. And I think that's where we are now. I think the bull market is near its end. And I really, really hope, and I know you should use the word hope. I hope it's not. I hope I'm wrong in that. And I'll show you some levels that if we get past, I'll feel a lot better. And longer term, we take a look at a weekly chart, we're still okay. And we'll get to that in a minute. But the thing that struck me this, this morning about this quote is it looks like this market is doing a big picture top, but that doesn't mean you want to go out and bet the farm on that. What you need to do is be prudent and let that develop. And I know Livermore said this before, but the point is that sometimes these things take time to develop, and they don't always happen on your time frame. Now, this slide might be a little bit out of order, but as I often say, once you're in a trade, there's always a reason to exit and rarely a reason to stay. You could always reason why you should exit a trade. Accountability. This is probably the next biggest thing or next important trade out of all the ones out there. Robin Rotella from Rotella Capital Management once said, you do not have to explain the reasons, okay, your reasons to a higher official to escape censure. Now, if you think about this, if you have a boss, you have to explain what you're doing. If you have clients, you have to explain what you're doing, okay? But as a trader, you have a far harder task. You must instead... Justify your actions to yourself. That's not easy. There's no way to hide when trading because you always stand alone. If you go to Books Read on my website, you'll see I have elements of successful trading listed as one of my books that I would recommend you read. Not so much for the technical analysis in it, which I don't even remember what he talked about, but more so for the psychology. The psychology section of this book is golden. And maybe maybe it was good for me because I read it when I was going through tough times. And let's face it, as traders, you always seem to be going through tough times. Okay. And then every now and then you feel like God and then the market smacks you and you go back to tough times. I hate the saying, you know, you're either going into the storm or coming out of a storm. I hate when people say that. But as a trader, it's pretty much true, you know. <laughs> You're either getting ready to go into a storm or you're just coming out of a storm. But anyway, uh, read the psychology the, the psychology section of the book alone is worth getting. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm looking at the book on my bookshelf here. Maybe I need to flip through the front of it and see what he talked about as far as technical analysis is concerned. One thing I found interesting is I later read that Rotella wrote the book when he himself was going through very tough times. And I noticed and in looking on the internet to find this picture of him on his website, uh, Rotella Capital Management, I think is the website, uh, looks like he's done quite well for himself. So he went through tough times, as we all do, as we all will again. And that's perfectly normal. Now, if you ever find yourself not holding yourself accountable, the solution to that is pretty simple. Would you be brave enough to have someone else? hold you accountable. Now, I've told this story before about Dr. John, and this is not really Dr. John, but it's a metaphor for Dr. John, I guess. Dr. John is smart. Dr. John is a smart doctor. Dr. John is a entrepreneur. 
He's a real estate investor, and he's a pretty damn good trader. And he's a really good stock, stock picker. And he gets my methodology. It clicks with him. I'm not saying my methodology is be all end all. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Why can you say more than one way to skin a cat, but if you talk about a dead cat bounce, everybody gets their panties in a wad? I, why is that? I saw somebody on Facebook was talking about that. So I actually wrote about that a while back. It's like, hey, what, the cat was already dead, so what difference does it make? It's like you can beat a dead horse. Why can't you talk about a dead cat bounce? And, and the cat had a good life. He, uh, he would go in his little litter box and do his business, and then he'd go walk around the kitchen counters, and he enjoyed the house a lot more. Who was it? David Byrne once said, cats enjoy houses a lot more than people. Anyway, where was I? <laughs> so Dr. John is pretty good. The methodology clicks with him. And he gets it, and he's a good stock picker. And he does really well for a while, and then he ends up in a downward spiral. Why? Well, because he starts day trading, or he starts trading in less than ideal conditions. He starts micromanaging in a host of other bad behaviors. So I said, look, here's the deal. You obviously know what you're doing. You're obviously are pretty damn good as a trader. You just kind of come unglued every now and then and start day trading and start doing all these other things. What would happen if you told your wife, look, honey, this is what I'm doing. I'm following this trend following methodology from this dude. Big Dave, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and I've researched his stuff, and I've researched a lot of other stuff, but this stuff makes the most sense to me, and here's a trade that I'm thinking about doing. Notice it's in a really nice trend. It's in a really persistent trend. It's an accelerating trend. It's a trend knockout pattern. It's got a nice wide range bar down. This is where I'm going to get in. This is where I'm going to put my stop. And this is where I'm going to take partial profits. And this is how I'm going to trail my stop higher once I get into the position. The market is trending right now. The stock is trending very nicely. It's set up. And the sector is also trending. All of these pieces of the puzzle fit. This is what I'm going to do. Now, baby, you need to realize that not every trade will work. There is a risk of loss in this trade. But I do feel that the odds are stacked in my favor, and it's worth taking this trade. And here's where I'm going to enter. And if and only if it triggers an entry, I will take the trade. If it does not trigger an entry, I will not take the trade. And once I'm in the trade, I am not going to micromanage a trade. I'm just going to follow this set plan here. Now, we might use a little discretion if it comes close to, to stopping out or it just kind of nicks the stop a little bit. We'll give it a tiny bit of wiggle room, but we're not going to hold on and hope if it continues to drop. We'll just get out. We might lose a tiny bit more than we intended. We're going to risk 2% of this trade, and that's it. And if it rallies up and hits the initial profit target, we can take, initial pro we can take those profits off, half of them off, okay, kind of giving you the whole methodology in a nutshell here. And we might use a little discretion if it gets within eh, a few cents of the profit target. It just can't seem to get there. We might take profits a little bit early. Or if it blows through the profit target and keeps on going, we might hold until the end of the day and squeeze out a little bit more. But here's the general plan. And those were the few little caveats that we might tweak it just a little bit. For the most part, though, we're going to let the – carefully plan trade play out in the markets. And this is what we're going to do. So, Dr. John, would you be willing to show your wife your trading plan and show her how you traded the plan, good, bad, or indifferent, and show her how it all turns out and shapes out? He said, oh, no. That would end the marriage. So that's another one of those introspection things like Rotella says, holding yourself accountable, not to a higher person, but yourself is a really hard thing to do. 
Doug Hershon once said, which I think is pretty smart, asking to be held accountable isn't a sign of weakness. It's an indication that you know yourself. I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. I think it's worth telling. Uh, accountability is, is one of the things that I noticed that Tim Ferriss harps upon over and over again. A lot of the things that come out of like a Tim Ferriss book aren't things that it's not like a huge epiphany. It's things you already know, but sometimes it helps to hear them again. And I think it was um, he tells a story of uh, holding yourself accountable with like somebody, uh, a, a Jewish person wrote a check for $100,000 out to or $1,000. It might have been $100,000. $1,000 out to the National American National Nazi Association, something like that, gave it to a friend and said, if I don't lose 20 pounds in this three months or whatever the period is, then I want you to mail this letter to the American Nazi Association with a check for $1,000 in it. Well, guess what? He lost the weight because he held himself accountable. Okay? So holding yourself accountable is hard but if you want, and if is the key word in that sentence, if you really want to be accountable and you're a little worried that you can't hold yourself accountable, then you can involve someone else. And maybe you could do something like reward that person if you're not accountable. Now, that's tough. And I know a spouse is tough, like Dr. John pointed out. But I'll just give you an example in life. A friend of mine, he's a trader. And as us traders often do, we sit around a lot getting fat. That's how I got the name Big Dave. And he decided, you know what? I'm tired of being fat. I'm tired of being swollen. Okay? I'm going to work out. Well, how am I going to make myself accountable to work out? Well, what he did was he found someone who was younger and needed money. Okay? And said, here's the deal. I'll pay your gas, I'll pay your gym membership, and I will pay you $20 every time you ride by my house at 7.05 in the morning, and I'm not sitting on the front porch waiting for you to pick me up. So he had an incentive, and maybe he might want to sleep in, but it's going to cost him 20 bucks to hold himself accountable. So put some sort of metrics in place. Steve says, dead, dead cats make great doorstops. <laughs> now, another one of these traits of traders is that you are accepting. If anyone has kids or raised kids, you'll know that sometimes you say, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. You give them whatever and then they throw a fit. It's like... Geez, you have to be accepting. You have to accept what little or, or more the market gives you. Now, along those same lines, a successful trader is also very gracious. And I know it's hard, but if you catch a trend and then you get stopped out and you give up a little bit of that trend, instead of dropping an F-bomb and getting pissed off because you lost money, at the end, although you made a lot of money overall in the trade, then you need to be gracious. I learned this lesson early on. I had some options positions on, or one position in particular, and I got screwed, I think, by the market makers for about three quarters of a point. And it was like an option that was 30-something points or 29 points. I forget exactly how much, but it was substantial on like a $30 stock. And the guy on the other end of the phone was a little bit more seasoned than me. And he's like, let me get this straight. You just made 20 something dollars, $29 on a, an options trade. And you're complaining. And I probably spent maybe a dollar on the trade altogether, if I remember, uh, on the options. And made $29, so $28, whatever I cleared. He goes, and you're complaining? You made 29 points and you're complaining that... In the end, you gave up three quarters of a point, and then just kind of hit me. It's like, well, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather just enjoy that money. And I say this quite often, until a point where I get sick of myself saying it. But when 
people complain when they make money in a trade and they complain, a trade that I recommended, I just say, look, send me the money. That money is just stressing you out. Send me the money. You have to be agnostic. As I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts. What is, is. The price of the stock, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone will sell it to you for. Okay? And the value of the stock, the bid, is what somebody will pay for it. So unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. I guess I'm showing my age. Does anybody remember when he got on TV and was like, define is? <laughs> My brain was like, rrr, rrr, what did you say? Another trade of successful traders are good planners. Mike Tyson once said, although I've recently read where I think it's attributed to his trainer, but either way, it comes from his camp. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I see it all the time. I see people who are really good planners in trades, and they show me their plan, and oh, sounds like a good plan to me, and I agree. And what happens? Well, they pull the plug. 10 minutes after in the trade because the market is no longer going their way. Well, it's tough. It's tough getting beat up in a market. And one way to solve for that, as I preach, and as I think I've said already today, is make fewer observations. Who was it? Robert Frey said 75% of the time as a trader, you're in a state of regret or drawdown. Okay. So the majority of times are going to be tough times. And the more observations you make, the better the chances are that it's going to be a negative observation. The more tempted you will be to do something. As I wrote a while back, I was working on an article for the website, and the stock ran up about 15% one day. It was a PI, PI, and uh, I was continuing to work on the article, and then I kept a loose eye on the screen, and all of a sudden the stock starts dropping. And it was only up 11%. Well, 11% in one day is a pretty damn good move. But I felt myself feeling like, damn, I'm losing money on this trade. Okay. If I would have checked it at the end of the day and saw that I made 11% on the day, I wouldn't have put a microscope to the chart and said, well, you were up 20% uh, at one point or whatever it was, 15% at one point. I'd have said, hey, you know what? 11% is pretty good. Better than poke in the eye. Obviously, there's a lot of discipline when it comes to trading. And this is something I think I mentioned a few minutes ago. Trading and life is all about the micro. And that's another one of my takeaways from Tim Ferriss and the latest book, Tribe of Mentors. And somebody was asking for the link. That's the link to the books to read. And trading, and then I was thinking about it this morning, trading in life is all about the micro. If you're dieting, that second it takes to resist ordering the french fries, okay, is what it takes to be on a successful diet. If you're trading, those seconds it takes to place the order is what it takes to be a successful trader. So... Everyone focuses on the micro, and we all want to have these big hopes and dreams and everything, right? But the micro is really made up – the macro, I'm sorry. But everything – the mic, macro, easy for me to say, is made up of the micro. So it's those little tiny decisions that you make that only take a few seconds. And if you go and look at some of my older columns, you'll see where I take a big trade that lasted, say, a year or six months or at least – and I talk about how little amount of time it took. Yeah, it took maybe a couple hours to find that one trade. But once you found it, it only took a few minutes of your life, okay? It took less than a minute to place the order. And then once triggered, it took less than a minute to place a predictive stop. And then it took less than a minute to take partial profits when the partial profits were hit. And then throughout the trend, it took less than a minute to adjust your stop order when necessary, your trailing stop when necessary. So a trade that lasted six months, eight months, maybe even a year or longer really only takes a few minutes of your time. Provided, of course, you're disciplined enough to place those orders. Take a few minutes. Now, successful traders are... Humble. 
Getting back to the war of art, Steve Pressfield said, the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. You start researching trading, what comes up? Guys in Lamborghinis with big-breasted women, okay? They're like, hey, look at me. You want to be a trader like me? Send me your money, okay? And you could be just like me. Well, even if they did make the money, get the Lamborghini and the big-breasted woman, okay, could they repeat that again? Repeatability. So it's possible to be a one-hit wonder when it comes to markets. Uh, a friend of mine, he didn't, he didn't actually go out and, and claim that anybody else could do it, but he thought he could do it for sure. And he's no longer on the server, so I can talk about him. But I saw him take account of about $5,000 and turn it into nearly a million dollars. I saw this actually happen. I actually saw his trading statement when it was at about $975,000. And then the end of that story is eventually the broker sent him a letter as the account was nearly completely blown up and said, you obviously don't know what you're doing. We are cutting off your options trading on your account. It's like, boy, that little paternalism would have been nice when he was up about, uh, still up about 800,000, right? But the problem is it's not repeatable. And I told him, not that I want to be like, I told you so. I mean, I was a little jealous. Don't get me wrong. I mean, come on. I mean, geez, it's a pretty amazing thing. And it was, what's amazing about it was I remember the day he called me and said, uh, hey, if I want a stock to go up, do I buy a call or a put? Okay. And then I said, you buy a call. And the phone hung up. And he was using a local broker who didn't understand options. And he said, he calls me back. He goes, uh, my broker wants to know, do we open the position or do we close the position to, to start a position? I said, it's open, like you would think. Okay, and he hung, hangs on the phone. So that was his first trade of many. It was just in one stock, and he kept parlaying the options up. And he eventually turns a million dollars. Unfortunately, he round-tripped it. He ended up homeless and died. You know, womp, womp. You know, what a story. <laughs> and I remember when he was closing in on a million, I asked him what his plan was. He says when he hits five million, he's going he's gonna to exit out and buy a sailboat and live on a sailboat. He's like, okay, well, I said, what would happen, because you're so great at this, what would happen if, let's just suppose, you, you throw your money into annuity. Now, I know annuities aren't the best bet in the world, but another one is accountability things and discipline things. If you don't have it, then maybe that could give it to you. So, But what happens if you throw your money into annuity and you get $50,000 a year for the rest of your life? And back then, $50,000 wasn't a tremendous amount of money, but you could live on $50,000 and live fairly comfortable, at least in, in Louisiana, where the cost of living isn't ridiculous. And then I'll never forget, he's like, I'm not going to take advice from you. And he said it just like that. Well, unfortunately, it ended badly. And I'm not saying that to be shot in Friday. I'm just saying that there was no repeatability in that and that these disingenuous people on the Internet – claim that there is this repeatability. Good traders are humble. They don't post P&Ls. I have crossed paths with some very impressive traders, and to meet them, you would, you would never know. You would never know they're multimillionaires. People ran billions of dollars. They're humble. And the market will... The market will hand you your ass every now and then. That's just the fact of life. They don't post P&Ls. I see or I have seen people where they'll put their P&Ls up on Twitter or whatever. There's a danger in that. There's also good, bad, or indifferent. One of, one of the things is I have the luxury or not the luxury, however you want to look at it, of knowing a lot of these guys or knowing of a lot of these guys and people talk within the industry and all. And in some cases, they're being investigated by the SEC because they're making these claims about doing something, but they actually had an opposite trade in other accounts. And I don't want to dig myself in a hole. And then next thing you know, I'm in a defamation of character suit, suit until the SEC proves them wrong or right, you know, what they did, or the SEC finds them guilty. 
but they don't post P&Ls. They don't brag about what they made, and it's not even noon. It's like I occasionally will see these inflated claims, and I just can't help myself. It's like, well, let me just see what this dude's doing. Because maybe somebody does have that holy grail out there. So now I've got a cookie on my machine for a certain individual, and now he's, I'm getting ads saying, hey, it's not even noon, and I just made $10,000, and you can too. Making it sound like you can do that every single day, and you can't. And again, real traders are humble. They don't post pictures of themselves standing in front of Lambos. Wait a minute. How'd that get in there? You know, it's funny. Is look at <laughs> look at the size of me. I looks like a matchbox car. People are like, why do they call you Big Dave? It's like, well, look at this. You know, this is to scale. <laughs> so. All right, flippant is something that I often talk about, and I, I can't ever seem to get it exactly right. But you have to be sort of, and I also use the word antiseptic sometimes, but you have to be flippant and agnostic. It's kind of like it is what it is. You don't really care what you're trading. I, Whenever I travel, which I've done a lot of lately, between my two offices, office at my sister's house and my home office, is uh, I can't remember what stocks I'm long or short. Well, now we're down to two stocks, so I can remember it. But over the few months that I've been doing this, I have a hard time remembering. Rarely do I know what a company does other than what sector it's in, and I don't really care. In something like Forex, I can never remember what my positions are and whether I'm long or short or whatever. I actually have to log in and look. And you just kind of reach that point where you're detached and you become flippant. And I think the, where I got the word flip it from was Curtis Faith in an interview. Curtis Faith made a, a many millions of dollars and he blew up. He was one of the turtles. And his point was like, eh, if I didn't have that attitude to begin with, I never could have made the money. Well, you don't want to blow up, but you want to be flip it in that you don't care what you're trading. You don't want to try to outsmart the market. You take the necessary action without remorse. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed in more recent years is I'm actually glad when my stinkers stop out. I'm not glad I got stopped out. But if I'm in a stinker day after day after day and I'm following my plan like I preach, I don't want to be like the plumbers having the worst pipes. But if I'm following my plan and that plan says I have to stay with this stock until stopped out, I actually get relieved when I'm in a losing trade day after day after day, sometimes month after month, and it finally stops out. And as I often say, what I like to do is say, who was it, Paul Giamatti and um, John Adams? I say good day, sir, is what I say when stopped out. Good traders are also even keeled, Okay means that you kind of have to take things on balance. There's a problem with trading. It's the same problem with gambling. And it's very hard for us to overcome it. There's this little thing called dopamine that gets released in our brain. And there's obviously problems with, with dopamine because it takes more and more, and that's the gambler's high and the drug high and everything. It used to take one, now it takes four. What's that song? You don't get me high anymore. I actually have a slide with that in it somewhere. But anyway, the problem with trading is the high of a win is about half, and some people say as many as five or ten times, but it's about half as much as the emotions of a loss. So let's just keep it two to one to keep things simple. So you have to win a hell of a lot to overcome the negative emotions of a loss. Okay, that experience, that negative emotion of the loss is two times what you get from the high. And that's why it's so hard. That's the gambler's paradox is that you get the high from the win, but that's very short lived and it's not enough. And you've got to keep going for that high. And in the process, you end up losing and losing and losing. So that's something that's hard from a physiological standpoint for us to overcome. 
I think good traders are students of the markets. One thing I was thinking about before I went live this morning is that it's kind of the basis of trading full circle. We tend to holy grail hunt, holy grail hunt, add complexity, add complexity, add complexity. And then we reach a point where we start stripping away all those indicators, maybe leave a moving average or two on the chart or come back to a moving average and find something really simple. And we just say, OK, how can we stay on the right side of the market and maybe use something simple like Dave light, meaning that the lows are greater than moving average and uptrends or the highs are less than the moving average and downtrends. And I'll flesh that out in one second for those of you who are new to the methodology. But we're students and we don't feel like we know it all. And we constantly we're constantly, constantly, constantly learning. I'm on a constant journey, a psychological journey or psychology, not a psychological journey. Uh, I'll say that for the weekends. Uh, <laughs> I'm half kidding. Anyway, no, a psychology journey where I'm trying to figure out why I have such emotions. Well, guess what? It's built into our physiology. There's no escaping that. Why are the highs not that high and the lows so low? Well, that's dopamine. Again, physiology. Once you embrace all these things, your life gets a lot easier. So I'm a huge student of the neurology of it all, the psychology of it all, and I'm a huge student of how can I stay on the right side of the market? How can I find the best setups? And then factor that in with how do I execute the plan as I should? So we're students. Now, as I said before, just real quick, in order to trade, you're going to need help. Nobody is self-made. We all get help. Uh, in the presentation that I did prior to this one, I think about a year or two ago, maybe two years ago, when I did this first Trades to Traders thing, uh, I made a big list of everyone that's helped me over the years. And we all get help. And I still, I still seek out others to learn from. So don't feel like you have to, I need to do it all on my own. No, nobody does it all on their own. We all learn from others. Now, obviously, you're going to need money to trade. But if you can't afford to trade and you still want to trade, then obviously you need a paper trade. Realize there's a lot of emotions in actual trades or trade with little money you have where somehow you can get your money management right. But more importantly, instead of doing that, learn from someone and use that money on education. And then ideally you want to have some support and approval of significant others. And that could, that could be really detrimental to you if you don't. And as I often say, there's a lot of things under capitalization, trading with rent money, being undercapitalized, lack of support from significant others. There's a lot of things that you could just make a checklist and I have done it before that will make you doomed from the start. So check off all these things and make sure you cover these things before you start placing trades. And then obviously you're going to need a lot of a lot of patience. So that's a leftover slide, but I think it kind of dovetails in nicely. That's why I let it, uh, I kept it in here while developing discipline. You want to let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. And that's going to make your life a lot easier. As I said last week or week before, use a stop entry order and setups that don't trigger right away. I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but you can use those to what I call it a pay me order. Sometimes a market will spike up. You'll get your price, get out of half of your trade. And then sometimes you can use a hard stop. Once the market opens, put in a hard stop. And then go about your life or at the least put some alerts in place. And that's one of my favorite things to do is just put an alert in place when that stop is getting near. So you know that you have to take some action provided, of course, you're disciplined enough. If you're not disciplined, then put in a hard stop. I put in a hard stop on one yesterday. I got stopped out. Truth be told. Okay. You know what? My life was a lot easier. Because in days prior to it, here comes an admission of guilt. In days prior, I kept pulling the damn stock up. Oh, I was still losing, but it's not its not where my stop is or around where my stop is. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. It kind of touched the area where my stop is. And so finally, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, 
I was like, you know, screw this. I'm not, I'm not doing what I preach. I'm going to put in a hard stop. And I got stopped out. And you know what? I don't give a shit. I really don't. I don't care. I got stopped out. Well, now I'm like, I'm glad I got stopped out, just like I said earlier. All right. Uh, a couple of random thoughts. Uh, for a while, I've been talking about winter is coming, but not yet. And then I add a little question mark to it because we could be in the process of making a top. Now, process is a key word in that sentence. Now, as I've been saying quite a bit, you can't have a bear market without downside. Dave Light, Dave Light or Daylight, as we was originally called, is simply the highs or less than the moving average, and that's it. And this is what amazes me after years of, of um, the Fibonacci and the, the way of counting and the oscillators and the things of that nature. I've come back to something simple as, one, looking at charts, and two, occasionally throwing a moving average in and just looking at something as simple as Dave Light to keep you on the right side of the market. And this just kind of blows me away. And these indicators are free, and they will be in Metastock in about another month, maybe a little bit longer when the next version comes out. But notice that looking at a weekly chart with a 50-week moving average, okay, that in the bull markets you had a lot of upside daylight, Dave Light, the green, and in bear markets you had a lot of red. And in sometimes in bull markets you will have some corrections along the way with a little bit of red, okay. And then you can see this last little leg we've been in back in 2000, of course, we did have, and we did actually short back in 2015, 2016. Go back and look at the portfolio if you want, and you'll see that we put some shorts on. We didn't get rich, but we made a little bit of money even though the market went down, which is always a good thing. And then since that correction, we've had a pretty good run. Now, it could be in a bit of a correction now, or obviously we are. We'll take a look at daily in just one second. But the point is that something as simple as Dave Light can help to keep you on the right side of the market. I know. I know. It's hard to believe that this is really simple. And as I often preach to a point of <laughs> and not him, but whenever I'm in a presentation, every now and then I will physically be somewhere in a presentation and somebody will show their, their system with 100 buys and sells on a chart. And you like usually invariably they have a moving average plotted, and you just look at it and say, well, geez, you could have bought when it got above the moving average and then sold when it dropped below the moving average, and you would have caught the whole trend. Well, there's no huge epiphany there, although when I first saw it, I was pretty amazed. But if anything, it just reaffirms the fact that everything works better with trend. So if you think you have the holy grail, that's great, but plot a moving average or just Better yet, just draw a big blue arrow on your chart and see if that would have also worked. Now, one thing I learned, as I've said recently, from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts is that tops are usually more of a process and bottoms are more of an event. And that kind of – it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that because when you think about a market selling off, you think about a market crash, okay? And the media sure gets excited about it, and the media sure inflates it, okay? But the reality is, and as I've done presentations throughout this year so far, go back and look at some of those from the weekly charts and get them on YouTube. You'll see that going back to even some of the, the market crashes, so to speak, they were a bit of a process. The market just didn't wake up and, and crash. It had kind of a gradual rollover and eventually crash. And here's the good thing. If you're using stops, okay, we got stopped out of our last long last week, I think, or week before. See, I already forgot about it. But if you're using stops, then you will get stopped out, not all the time, but more than likely you'll get stopped out of your longs before a crash because there will be a deterioration inside of the market. Some sectors will start to crash, especially momentum. Like right now, the momentum was in technology or some technology that is beginning to, I don't want to use the word crash, but sell off the hardest. So that deterioration will happen. But if you take a look at this little, whatever you want to call it, these little zigzags in here going back to late last year, you could see that the market has been more of a process type of top. It's not making much headway. 
after making those new highs earlier this year, it's kind of just chopped back and forth. Okay. Simple equals trend following moron. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> That's my actual mailbox. I painted that myself a while back. The delivery guy whacked it so it doesn't look nearly as good. My daughter made me take it down because we're selling a house. <laughs> we're downsizing. Anyway. So I just got a letter from a new client, which is pretty exciting. I do not care if there are times, no or few trades or setups for the service. I am counting on you to keep me on the right side of the market rather than a bunch of individual trades and setups. I'm sure you feel the pressure to have recommendations. Yes, as I often say earlier in my public career as a trader, the salespeople back then, I was part of a bigger website, and they had salespeople, they would call me up and really complain, Dave, you got to recommend something. We're losing clients. But what's interesting is if I went through a string of really bad trades, we wouldn't comparatively, at least, lose a whole lot of clients. So it made me realize that, oh, you know what? I want to keep clients, just throw some crap out there and just keep them busy. It's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Stick to my guns. If I'm not doing anything, then why should I recommend you do something? I would much rather sit out a period of time rather than try to swim upstream. I look forward to a long and prosperous partnership. So do I. But that's music to my ears. How do I find 100 more of people who get it? Okay? Go have fun somewhere else. As I say, have an affair. That way you'll lose half your money. I need some new jokes. Oh, if you want to start watching Trading Full Circle, where I spend a lot of time talking about Dave Light for free, and a lot of these other concepts, at least get the base down. I mean, if you get the base down, I think you got it, and that's free. So just go to davelander.com slash two dash trade dash docs dash successfully. Well, that's a mouthful. I probably need to shorten that, Earl. All right, let's go to the live charts. Any questions, comments, amusing anecdotes, anecdotes about anything we've discussed so far? Okay. We'll go ahead and pop up the charts. Now, you guys want to ask about – individual stocks feel free to start doing so now while i get these charts set up uh what i want to do real quick is let's take a look at the overall market and i want to show you what's going on in major indices and then i want to drill down into some sector action and show you how in this particular point at this particular point in time internally the sector action is reflecting what's going on in the overall market and then we probably should take a look at the major mix real quick since we have time okay S&P let's look at the micro and work our way out to the macro we're getting a little bit of a bounce today obviously a little captain obvious statement so that's okay it's better than poking the eye but I wouldn't get too excited just yet as you can see we've been in pretty slide pretty serious slide lately market probably a little bit oversold I would be hesitant to plot an oscillator. I don't use oscillators, FYI. But I'd be hesitant to plot an oscillator, especially one that is bound, meaning that it has a, a can only go between, let's say, 0 and 100, because it's going to make you think that, hey, the market's going to go straight back up. And maybe it will, but I wouldn't, unless you want to make that your life's work, I wouldn't do that in and of itself. I'm not a big fan of oscillators, as you can tell. My big concern with the S&P 500 is that we had the sell-off, we had the retrace rally, and so far we haven't gotten past that retrace. Let's just say 2,800 round numbers, okay? For me to feel better about this market, we have to get above 2,800. Now, let's put a 20-day moving average in. Keep the stock picks coming. That's great. Fantastic, okay? Um, there's not a whole lot out there, so I probably won't like a whole lot of them. That's not, don't take that personally. It's just a function of the market. As I said it a minute ago, you know, where are we now? 2,600. Where are we three, four months ago? 2,600. Now, notice this is a 200 day moving average, and this is the S&P 500. Notice the day of light throughout this leg. We've had a pretty good run in here. Even back here was mostly above the 200 day moving average. And then so far, 
we just kind of had a little kiss back in February and a little kiss now. And everybody's watching this. Now, there's nothing magical about the 200-day moving average. But it can, just like the 50, okay, just like the 50 on a week lead chart, 50-week moving average on a weekly, can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, obviously, as I said a minute ago, if you're using stops, you probably would have gotten stopped out of your longs by now. And if not, it's probably one hell of a uh, one hell of a long. Okay. If you have to be one hell of a charming pig, what's that from? Pulp Fiction. But you can see so far holding above at the little tag there recently above the 20-day moving average. Again, nothing magical about that. And again, this could be like a big picture process type of top. Okay. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Okay. Now, the NASDAQ sort of reflects what happened in technology. The market broke out to new highs, okay, and then came right back in. So that scores as a bummer. As I often say, study your classical technical analysis, but realize that it often doesn't shake out exactly as it does in the books, in the textbooks, okay? By that, what I mean is a, a double top in a textbook will look like this, okay? And it makes it look like, oh, okay, I rec oops, sorry. A double top will look like this, and you think, okay, that makes a lot of sense. It's a top, and there's a top, that's double top. Yep, it's double top. In reality, as I often say, it stalls short of that high, vis-a-vis -vis the S&P 500 right now, or it, it shoots past it a little bit. And these are the worst because this traps the most amount of people in the market, okay? And what's kind of interesting is the Russell 2000 looks like this, the NASDAQ looks like this, and the S&P looks like this. So we got three double tops in three different indices. So there's the NASDAQ, decent little bounce today. It's good to see the market bouncing a little bit. Means it's not a route so far, at least. That's a good thing. Take a look at Russell 2000. Again, double top happening there. Still above the 200-day moving average, up about a percent. Let's hope it holds. Okay. But Dave, you're short. The, you're short. I was like, well, I'm short a couple stocks, but I'd rather I'd rather the market go up, get stopped out of my shorts, and start getting along again and ride this bull market for 10, 10 years or more. Okay. Doesn't mean that I'm. A pessimist. I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. Uh, what's interesting is no place to run, no place to hide. Your commodity-related stocks, such as energies and metals and mining, also kind of looking ugly in here, certainly not going up as of late. Uh, one of you guys was pointing out, Steve was pointing out yesterday, that the dollar looks like it's improving. Yes, it is. That What would that do to commodities? That would make commodities go down because they'd be worth less. So that could put a little pressure on commodities. So good eye, Steve. I wouldn't rush out and buy the dollar just yet, although the dollar yen looks like it's trying to bottom out at least on a like an hourly chart. But as you go through these sectors, you'll see a lot of them look like the overall market. The brick and mortar type areas, such as the banks, material construction, literally brick and mortar, manufacturing, kind of look like the S&P itself. You've got a sharp sell off, Retrace rally and just kind of failing to get past that retrace. Retail, another one. As you can see, retrace rally, selling off. Transports, same sort of action. Got fairly close to that, that high in here. By the way, I'm just kind of noticing this. This does kind of look like a complex head and shoulders top. I don't. I wouldn't rush out and trade off that, that big picture technical analysis, but do learn it, okay? You know, help to give you a feel for what's going on, but wait for some sort of setup or signal before you actually trade off those patterns in and of themselves. I've seen people do blogs and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Oh, this guy deserves it, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm not, I won't do it. Take the high road, Dave, take the high road. Anyway, he, he dust off his books on technical analysis and the market is always at a pattern based on his, analysis and it's always reversing or continuing or whatever and it's a little frustrating i think you would go nuts if you tried to 
use every single piece of technical analysis every day. Anyway, I digress. Most technology-related areas, hardware, software, if you're going to have hardware, you're going to need software, right? Semiconductors look a lot like the NASDAQ itself. Nice little breakout. Come right back in. It came right back in, I should say. Um, if you don't know anything about markets, do the net-net test, okay? Go back to November. And the semiconductors, where were we? 3,600, okay? Where are we now? 3,570. Not a whole lot of forward progress in a long, long time. Some zigs and zags, yes, in between, but not a whole lot of progress as of late. Take a look at bonds. The good thing about bonds is they're headed a little higher, okay, as of late. So it's not going to be a route lower, which I think many feared. And we did find a little support at the 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018 lows, okay, or 2017 lows. So that's a good thing. Bonds are bottoming out a little bit. And as you go through these sectors, again, they either broke out, came back in, or failed in a retrace rallies. And that's pretty much it as far as the sector action is concerned. We can look at the major MIGs. I don't see the reason. We don't have to spend a lot of time on them. But take a look at the major MIGs, which are just the major sectors. And I'll just go through them quickly. I don't know if the software can keep up. But, again, same patterns. Retrace stall, retrace stall, breakout stall. Retrace stall, retrace stall, retrace stall, <laughs> retrace stall. You see, same sort of patterns are, are shaking out through all the sectors. Now I look at all 239 of these each day, but you could just look at the major ones. That took, what, less than a minute to get a feel of what's going on. All right, enough of my pontification. LGCY, let's keep those stocks flowing. Let's take a look at them. We should have time to get to everybody's picks today. Yeah, I like this one a lot. I would put it in my momentum list. Two things, two problems. One, it's an energy, and energies aren't doing that well right now, okay? Flat at best, retrace, stall, right? Okay. So it's one of those cases where it was a jewels that had the one charming pig, you know? Uh, and it is one charming pig. You've got acceleration higher. I'd like a little bit more knockout move here. So it's not bad at all. Got a little bit overhead way back here, but who cares? 2015, that was a long time ago. So, yeah, maybe a little bit more knockout move, but I would frame that within the fact that the energies aren't doing really well right now, okay? But, yeah, put it on your momentum list. I'm sure it's on mine. James wants to know about NTNX. NTNX. Um, if you... Uh, there was a time when you registered for the webinars, you didn't have to put your name in. So next, if you don't mind, those of you, I don't know if you can see your name or not, but if you don't see your name, then uh, re-register. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, my big concern, and I don't want to keep saying this, but let me just get it out once, is that these stocks that have been in longer-term uptrends may be ripe to sell off. And not as much with a technology stock like this, but something a little bit more established and or and or higher volume and the reason there being is they might be priced for perfection okay and if the market begins to crack a little bit the bigger they are the harder they'll fall but yeah i can't really argue with this stock you've got a nice breakout you got a nice pullback so yeah absolutely that looks pretty darn good again it's hard for me to get excited about the markets uh james that's actually in the landry list today uh so good eye on that one the one that starts with c it ends in A. How's that for a hint? You just got to figure out two letters. Twilio, T-W-L-O. Yeah, this looks okay at first glance. I see I have a little line drawn in here. Um, it's okay. Now, it did, I guess one concern I have is it broke out, but it kind of drifted in here, Okay. It sort of was off to the races like back here, and then it just kind of drifted and drifted and drifted. I would pass based on those drift on the drifting action, but you could certainly do much worse than that. Okay. But I would pass based on this. Arsony wants to know about E C Y T. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Let's back chart out a little bit. A couple things. Uh well, you got this huge gap down way back here, so it can trade all over the place. I think we covered this before. 
Uh, you had this huge gap up here, okay, and then you could see a lot of times you're one and done with these gaps. HV is crazy high. I would pass just because of its sporadic nature in the past. But, yeah, I hear you. If all I was seeing was this run higher here, followed by a little bit of double top knockout type of move, follow, you know, you had acceleration higher. So, for the most part, I'd say this looks pretty good. Maybe a tiny bit more knockout move based on this crazy high volatility. But when you back the chart way out, you can see it is kind of a wide and loose stock. So I would pass based on the volatility. It's just kind of crazy. John wants to know about Zen as a long. Everything Zen. Who sung that? Bush? Yeah, put that on your momentum list. Um, can't really argue with it. Maybe a little bit more pullback in here. It has had a decent trend higher. And again, same sort of thing as far as longer term uptrends, and then you have to figure the other hard they fall. You know, let me just show you an example. This is on a laundry list, but I'm not telling my peeps to go after it. But here you have a stock that's pretty big and thick, okay? What's that? Uh, over at least a million on average, maybe even more. This is the, right here. Here's your average volume. So I would say this is probably priced for perfection, but this is a good-looking stock. Nice acceleration higher, nice little pullback, but I'm going to pass. Okay, now, now it looks pretty good too. You guys are uh, you guys are pretty smart. Yeah, you got a nice, decent uptrend followed by a pullback. Okay. Um, the only problem is the overall market. Okay, so. A setup would really have to knock my socks off for me to want to take it. CRSP, that's made my list recently, so good eye on that one. Uh, you said on a weekly? TKO? Yeah, it'd actually have to be a little bit deeper for a TKO, but I hear you. Maybe when I get really old, I'll just trade weekly TKOs. Let's zoom in a little bit. My only problem on a daily is that it sort of broke out, and then it's come all the way back into where it broke out. And then let's do the net-net change. I know you were talking weekly, so I don't want to beat you up too much. But net-net, I mean, this is a biotech with an HV of 92. So 2%, that's a, you know, a Nat's eyelash. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, so I would pass based on the fact that it's come back in. Iova? Now, draw your... Um, Let's do a net net, okay? Yeah, at first glance, it looks like a nice uptrend, but let's do a net net, okay? Where was it at the beginning of February? Okay, 16 something, and where is it now? 16 something. So I would pass based on the big blue arrow. Also, notice from webinars past that it had a nice run in here and then a the acceleration slowed. As I preach, ad nauseum, this is what you want your trends to look like. All those things I said earlier about telling your wife or your husband before you make your trade, it's going to be an accelerating trend. It's going to be a persisting trend and all these things I preach about. So I'd pass on that one. Sirs for Peter. If I don't call your name out, it's because I don't see a name. So again, re-register if you want. Uh, no, too much. Look, too much uh, bad memories here. Look at all this overhead supply back here. Um, and you say, well, Dave, that's back in 2016. Well, markets have long, long memories. You'd be surprised how long somebody will hold onto a stock. Now, eventually, it might work its way through the system. Kim, there's a blast from the past. That that was a big winner a couple of years back for us. Until it wasn't. <laughs> No, it's just too wide and loose now, okay? I think we had a trailing stop like right in here somewhere, believe it or not. So we did give up something in the end, but so what? I mean, it was like a fun ride from down here somewhere. Oh, I see it right there, a little TKO, bam, right there. Uh, no, you got the big gap down, and now it's wide and loose, so there's nothing to do there. And then again, let's do the net-net trick. Well, up a little bit, but, I mean, you could probably find a bar where it hasn't. Let's see, we can fix it. Okay, you go all the way back to November and pretty much unchanged. So draw your line, draw your arrows. 
Sale, yeah, sale is one that I've been showing on my on my uh, official setups for a while, and then now it's just too many days in the pullback, and I'm kind of framing that within the fact that the market doesn't look great. I mean, you could certainly do much worse. This is still an IPO, so I still think it has potential. It's a two-day chart, three-day chart, four-day chart. You know, if you look at it weekly, it looks pretty damn good, right? But I'm going to pass. I think it's a uh, – I don't see any reason to go after this one at this juncture. Let's take a look at the day blight on that on like a five-day. That would be fun to do. I've got a little um, IPO thing that you can – well, I would have triggered like right in here. NC immediately had a little bit of a pullback, but then it eventually took off. IPOs have a little bit of a breakout characteristic to them. Oh, actually, it would have been on this day here, I think, would have been you buy. As I preach, sometimes something as simple as a new closing high with a moving average. This is just a five-day moving average. A little day blight can be a cool entry. But uh, I would pass too many days in the, uh, in the moving average. I mean, I'm in the price. EC? No, you got the sideways problem. Okay, where's the price now? Where was it back in February? Unchanged. Let's pass on that one. Um, you know, put on your momentum list if you want. If you're long, stay long. I mean, that looks like a pretty decent looking stock. EYCT or ECYT, ECYT. Yeah, we talked about this one, didn't we? Yeah, we talked about that one. Okay. NIHD. I'll try to get it loaded uh, as soon as possible. This one looks kind of interesting. This has been catching my eye lately. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout on this, but it's had a nice thrust higher. I like it. Okay, I do like it. Uh, HV, a little bit on the crazy side, more than a little crazy. And it does have some bad memories going back, so that would probably keep me out of it, okay? So I could rule it out based on that, but everything else looks pretty damn good because you had this huge base. What did I talk about earlier? Laying groundwork. So all these people who fought it out for a year in here were laying the groundwork for this stock to take off. But, yeah, it looks pretty good. You could certainly do much worse, okay? But ideally, I want to see a little bit more pullback, and then again, I would pass based on the tremendous amount of overhead supply going way back. But it's not bad. It's not bad at all. So I can't argue with it other than it's got a little bit of bad memories. RCM, RCM. Yeah, this looks fantastic. Um, not incredibly thin, but a little bit thinner issue. Nice run higher. Could use a little bit more pullback. Okay, that's a decent-looking stock. Um, but it does have some bad memories going way back. That's way back to 14. Maybe in a little bit more pullback, but I, I would frame it within two things. One, the overall market's not doing great. It's Tommy, if you heard that before. And two, it has a little bit of overhead supply or bad memories, whatever you want to call it. Take a look at J&P. My problem here is it broke out and then it came all the way back in to its breakout level so i would pass based on that okay our city wants to know about axgn gn yeah it looks pretty good um nice persistent trend with today's action in here you, you had a tko yesterday could have been a little bit bigger tko but with today's action now it's okay i prefer almost a little bit more and keep in mind, now is a time where I'm looking for a little bit more perfection in markets. I guess the only scary thing is it's had such a great run, then we could end up with the bigger they are, the harder they fall type of situation. But I certainly can't argue with it, except for the fact that health services, let's see what the, the subsector is doing. Health services is a little bit on the iffy side, kind of have a double top working there. Okay, Everything's a little bit on the iffy side, and the overall market is a little bit on the iffy side. But, you know, good eye on that. Mr. Phil wants to talk about PRFT. Um, let's back this out a little bit. Yeah, longer term, now keep in mind personalities change. Longer term, I don't like the way the stock acts because it's all over the place. It's electrocardiogram or Jackie Mason stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, right? But I hear you, Phil. Shorter term looks pretty good. Where is that 50-day? Is this 50-day moving average, Phil? 
Let's see where the 50 is. No, nope, nowhere near. Oops. Um, how many days in the pullback? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Eh, too many days in the pullback. And again, I'm being picky based on the market conditions and then not pull back deep enough. So I would pass based on those reasons. If the market was doing fantastic, then maybe I would like this a little bit better. But then all those aforementioned reasons, kind of like all over the place, needs a little bit deeper pullback. And then it's also pull back too many days. So I'd pass based on all that. We're nearly out of time. Anybody else? While we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLander.com. And if I can't give you a quick answer, in other words, if the answer requires a lot of thought, I'll make it fodder for the next show. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, thanks everyone. And I hope to see you guys again next week. For those who celebrate, happy Easter.